On today's episode of Health Theory with the incredible guys at Mind Pump, we cover their individual backgrounds in fitness, why they started Mind Pump in the first place, how they skyrocketed to podcast stardom, why cardio is terrible for weight loss, and the unsexy truth behind the biggest health problems. Hey everybody, welcome to Health Theory. Today's guests are Sal, Adam, and Justin, the triumvirate behind the behemoth health and fitness podcast, Mind Pump. They've been putting out a podcast every weekday for the last three years and are rapidly approaching episode 800, which is madness. They are perpetually in the top 10 on iTunes and have had several times ranked number one in the health category. Their unique blend of raw truth, entertaining style, and relatability are what make them so damn great. And that's why I am excited to have them on today. But what I want to know, guys, is that thing that makes you so interesting, that blend of like the entertainment and the raw truth, how did that get started? Why did that become the foundation of who oh, you are? Funny. Uh, Just being we, ourselves, I guess, huh? Yeah, we, you know, it's funny. The fitness industry now has been a, a monster for a few decades. And it's interesting when you have people coming in and just being as real and authentic as possible, and that being uh, you know, striking a chord. It's, mm. It, it t tells you a lot about the fitness industry. We all grew up in the fitness industry. We've been doing this for a long time. And when we first met, we all sat down and one of the number one things that we all connected over was to be as authentic as possible and to say what was on our mind. And hopefully it would resonate and it seems like it has. Well, well, why was that important to you guys though? Well, I think, I think it's important too that I, none of us have talent when it comes to being on a camera. <laughs> Speak for yourself. No, we really don't. I mean, we, we got into this. I mean, we were all fitness professionals, and that was what we were great at. That's our expertise. Um, it was not acting or getting on a camera or getting on video or audio and recording a podcast. But what I think is so important is the authenticity of, of the message and then being true to ourselves. And I feel like we're in a space right now where a lot of people copy each other and a lot of people are putting out a bunch of bullshit just so they could sell and market something. In fact, like the, in our space, the way you make a lot of money is you, you build up a network of people, whether that be by taking ass shots or looking half naked on Instagram or whatever it takes to draw attention to people or get attention from people. And then you take that and then you give a, you support with a little bit of science and information and then you try and peddle some sort of a supplement. Mm. And that's been kind of the formula for like the last 15, 20 years or so in our space. And when we all got together, we met at my house and it really was just for us to get together. And at that time, Justin and I were working together on a, on a business. We were building an app at that time. And Sal and Doug, Doug's our producer, they were working on a, a online program. And we've been kind of communicating back and forth with each other because we all knew of each other, but none of us had actually all got in a room together. Mm. And the first time we sat, we sat in a living room just like this at my place. And it was just absolute fire. And what yeah. it was, was this, we felt that, that somebody needed to come out and speak the truth. And we, at that time, it wasn't about, oh, how are we gonna make money? Or how are we gonna do this? It really, we all had businesses on the side. We already had things that we were making money. So it wasn't like, oh, let's find a way to make a ton of money. It was us expressing our feelings about the space. And it was like two hours of just verbal diarrhea back and forth between all of us. And I didn't know it at the time, but Katrina, my girlfriend had, was sitting in the, the kitchen and she had hit record on the iPad because she said she was so enthralled by the conversation wow. that she felt she had to record it. And we ended up getting it all recorded. She says to me afterwards, hey, I, kept, I caught all that. She goes, it was so amazing to hear all that information going back and forth and the fact that you guys all don't agree that we yeah. sit there. And well, we, we all came discuss. from different backgrounds, which was really interesting. And each one of us had an experience that was very similar, but mm -hmm. me being more from like an athletic perspective, whereas, you know, like a bodybuilding perspective, whereas a wellness perspective and each one of us contributing towards that, like we were all trying to seek the same truth. And um, it, it was just interesting because like each one of those issues are something that you see, it's a common denominator in each one of those different realms. And um, we just started talking about uh, you know, what we went through with our clients and what they came in with, uh, you know, with their insecurities. And it's just, this industry is so based off of ego and being a superhero and it's just unrelatable. Well, that's a good point that you make right there too, is that, you know, I think we're one of the first got like buff physique fitness type guys that came out and were really vulnerable. Mm. Like we came out and it shared all of our own insecurities and what drove us to the, it drove us to fitness. And it was because we knew at that time, I mean, each of us have trained thousands of clients over our career. We've got 15 to 20 years experience, each of us. 
And something that we, I started to put together, at least after years and years of training clients, was almost everybody, uh, the, it's all rooted in some sort of an insecurity, whether you felt fat or you were too skinny or you didn't have muscles or girls didn't like you, mm, whatever, right. is typically what drove you to the gym. And a lot of times those insecurities drive us down the wrong path. And I think it drove us down the wrong path many a times. We, we experienced that ourselves coming up in this industry. And I'll tell you what, you know, the, the message tells people or motivates people through self-hate. So I'm going to the gym because I hate the way I look. I'm eating this particular way because I hate my body. And it can be quite motivating for a short period of time, but think of the decisions that you tend to make when you're hating yourself. Uh, they tend to be self-destructive over, especially over a long period of time. We all experienced that. We all did things to ourselves and ate particular ways that weren't the best for ourselves because we didn't like the way we looked or we were insecure about our athletic performance or whatever. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to flip the message. We're trying to say to people, look, uh, don't exercise because you hate yourself and don't eat because you hate yourself. Do those things because you love yourself and you want to take care of yourself. And you think about that. Think about that for a second. If, if you treated yourself like somebody you cared about, what kind of decisions would you make when you went to the gym? What kind of foods would you eat? It, it, it results in a much more consistent, uh, effective approach, but it's not sexy and it doesn't get you to buy you know, $100 worth of supplements, like I did many times as a teenager growing up, wanting to gain 10, 15 pounds of muscle. I'd buy all these products because they promised me so many, you know, things that just never came true. What was so different was, we, you have like the woo-woo hippie side, does all the meditating and talks like that all the time. And then you have like the hardcore bodybuilder side, take whatever it takes to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to meld the message because mm -hmm. there's something to take from both camps. I think that's so important. And that's another thing that I think is important in our space is we, uh, for marketing purposes, we like to, to separate everybody and put them in a box. Like, oh, you're, you're the cyclist guy, you go over here. Oh, you're a CrossFitter, oh, you go over here. Oh, you're a bodybuilder, oh, you go over here. Oh, you're a power lifter, you go over here. And my camp is better than your camp and we do things better than you do things. And, and we always oh, separate all of us and it's like, well. There's a lot to learn from everybody. Right. Yep. Yeah. So as a, an example of the sort of what I consider the darkness and then the light side. So, you know, you're talking about that the, when you're in a negative space, when you have that self-hatred actually can be powerful, but only briefly. Um, Adam, I wanted to talk about your story. One thing that I find just so interesting and so revealing is the way that people talk about themselves on the About Us page. And your guys' About Us page is like really raw. And um, I didn't realize that your father had committed suicide mm -hmm. when you were young and that then your mom remarried and it was an abusive relationship. How did that play into your desire to get into fitness and how has that taken you from sort of being compelled by a, a darker side of things and then to really find something beautiful in it. Well, I'm the oldest of five. After that happened, um, instantly I was kind of, you know, thrusted into this, you know, father role with or parenting type role at a very young age. So I think it matured me. It made me really strong. I mean, I think at that age, uh, it doesn't get much scarier than that, than with all that responsibility. So the way I look at fear is probably different than the average person. I'm not afraid of a lot of things. At least I'm not afraid to fail. I'm not afraid of these uh, obstacles that the average person will sit and ponder for days or get scared and not move forward in. Is that because you had to learn how to cope with it when you were young? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I've got stories that of you know me acting like a parent at eight and nine years old, which I thought was normal. I didn't think it was weird, you know, until I got older and I look back and reflect on, wow, that was a little different to be put in that position. But I also am very grateful for that because it's definitely turned me into the leader that I am today. So I think that put me out at a young age. I was out by 17. I uh, moved to the Bay Area to get a, away from my hometown where I didn't feel like my life was moving. And then I ended up going back to school. I was going to school for kinesiology and I kind of fell into a fitness job. I really wasn't into health and fitness yet. At that time, I was just kind of getting into working out and seeing my body change. And so I was into that piece of it. And what I had found was when I was working at this gym, I really, really liked the way it made me feel. And then I had a huge passion for it because I found that a lot of the strengths that I got from being a kid that was kind of parenting at a very young age was very similar to what I, the skills that I needed with clients. Because mm. many, many clients, even though they're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old and brilliant lawyers and doctors, a lot of them are in infancy when it comes to understanding their, their body and health and taking care of themselves. And so I think those skills that I picked up at, at a young age ended up carrying over into me being like a really good trainer.
No, that's super interesting. Out of curiosity, um, what do you want your fan base to take away from, and, and I'll really give this to all three of you, what do you want them to take from your vulnerability and the fact that like going through, you're like, you know, I divorced and I have two kids and you guys are just incredibly open with what you've been through and um, it, I, I know how it affects me and I know how it draws me to you, but what, what was the, the reasoning behind that? Well, I think it feels really good to be yourself, man. It's I also think, ther it's therapeutic on the I mean, podcast it's, to talk that yeah. way. Mm. We wouldn't be able to do this right here if it wasn't for that. I think that if I had to be putting on a facade or acting a certain way to get attention from people or to build a business, I don't know. I think uh, I think that's where people suffer from imposter syndrome because mm. they uh, and a lot of people do that, especially in this day and age with social media and the ability to Photoshop on and edit it up stuff and make it look so cool so people are attracted to it. I feel like the raw message that we put and being ourselves, I mean, it helps me sleep at night. Yeah. It makes me feel good about what we're doing because I get to do a job where I get to be me, you know? Mm. There's that integrity behind it that I think we all share. We just, we don't want to withhold anything because I think what we experienced in this industry, everything is withhold from the consumer. And uh, the, the wool sort of pulled over a lot of consumers' eyes as far as like promises of products and um, quick successes and you know quick fixes and pills and uh, I just felt like this is the only way that we can do it We have to be as honest as we possibly can and even for me like I'm super uncomfortable talking in front of people and like being on a mic and being on camera <laughs> But you know that like, all this is part of the growth process of being a human mm -hmm. being and trying to improve myself and uh, I feel like for me to share that, like I've gotten a lot of feedback just from people that have the same phobias mm. and for them to kind of come to me and be like, wow, you know, I, I love what you're doing and that, you know, you're taking this, you know, straight on and you might not be the best at this, but every time we listen, you get better. And so that makes me mm. feel good you know, that I can help somebody, you know, with that. You know, I think where part of this comes from is the fact that we were trainers for so long. And when you're talking about someone with health and fitness and you're talking about changing someone's diet and they're, they're insecure about their body or, you know, they got picked on because of it or maybe they just had a baby or they have low energy, whatever the case may be. Many times if I tell you about my issues or my particular insecurities or my vulnerabilities, it makes it you feel more comfortable and able to communicate back to me. And then we can start working together. And it's almost like it happened by accident. I remember, you know, as a, as a trainer, like, wow, the more vulnerable I am, the more honest I am, the more I let people in, the more they let me in, and the more effective I can be as an instructor. I'm able to get that idea through to someone because I could, I could give you a million different ways that, you know, or ideas or uh, pieces of knowledge that I think are going to benefit you. But if you don't, if those don't resonate with you, if they don't really impact you, um, then it doesn't matter. But if I can give you one, just one idea that truly changes the way you live for the better, then I've been successful. One thing I found super profound in your story, which ties into this notion that there are the BS myths that happen in the industry and then there's the real truth because it gets results and they're lasting, is you were at one point just in amazing shape, getting stronger day by day, and then something happened and suddenly you were still going as hard as you were, but you were losing mass, you were losing strength. What, what was that and, and what did that teach you about sort of the cultism that, that happens in the industry? It, um... In hindsight, it was the, the greatest uh, growth lesson I could ever have hoped for. At the time, it was uh, torture. It was absolute torture, it was terrible. I, you know, coming up in, in fitness, also being very insecure about my body, wanting to build muscle as a skinny kid growing up, I did lots of things to my body that weren't the best for it. I force fed myself I ate eight to 10 times a day. Sometimes I'd set my alarm in the middle of the night so I could wake up and take a weight gain or shake. Um, I'd take all kinds of supplements, uh, you know, everything over the counter that I thought would work and even things in the gray market um, that, you know, maybe 10 years ago you could buy designer steroids over the counter, so I'd take those. And at the age of, I want to say 29 or 30, my body rebelled. Um, I had severe gastro issues. Uh, I couldn't keep weight on my body. I felt weak. I felt tired. And for somebody who had built this shell of a body around, you know, like I did. I built this shell. I'm the buff, strong guy. I'm the confident, you know, energetic guy. And now I'm weak, losing muscle. I have no energy. Like, who am I? And I had to really 
uh, self-examine. I had to look and see what, what was going on. Now, at the time, I owned a personal training studio. And in my studio, I had you know, personal trainers like myself. I had massage therapists. I had a gut health specialist and, the, and a hormone specialist. And the gut health specialist and the hormone specialist were both on that wellness side. At the time, I would have considered woo-woo, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm the fitness guy, like lift weights, macros, proteins, fats, carbs, calories, that's it. They were much more into the other stuff, food intolerances, you know, sleep, um, how hormones, you know, uh, you know, how to balance out your hormones, meditation, that kind of stuff. And so finally I broke down and I sat down with them and I said, okay, um, what's going on? Like, I think I'm eating healthy. I think I'm doing everything right. I'm a fitness professional. What's going on? The doctor has no idea what's going on. They want to put me on all these medications. Like, what do I do? And so they sat me down and we talked about food intolerances. We talked about fasting. Um, we talked about uh, getting better sleep. And my entire approach to nutrition and training was flipped on its head. Now, here's the irony. The irony of all of this is I changed my approach because at the time, all I could focus on was my health. Like, I, I just need to be healthy. I don't care about building muscle. I don't care about being lean. Like, I need to be healthy because this, is, this isn't good. And so that's what I did. I focused on my health 100%. And the irony was I looked better than I had ever looked before. I walked around leaner than I'd ever looked before. I was strong, I was fit, and that was a paradigm shattering moment. I think the, 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 the best learning lessons that we get in life are the ones that are the hardest because they force you to really look at things and I, I, don't, think any other, I don't think anything else would have forced me to do that than, than that, mm. what happened to me. Now, if you guys had somebody come to you and you couldn't see them, they could only type you questions, you had no idea who they were, what their background was, anything like that, and they just said they're profoundly unhappy with where they're at from a physical standpoint. What are some universal principles that you can dictate to somebody that while there's no <clears throat> universal diet, that would help the greatest number I, of people? I have some things that I, I've started to do over years and years of training people. And the very first thing that I do with anybody is I actually ask them not to change anything. I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they try out what their girlfriend's doing or they're trying out what they, but their buddy does and they have no idea where their baseline is. I highly recommend tools. I love like, you know, the fat secrets or the, you know, uh, my fitness pal type of track food trackers. And I have them track just for like a week or two of consistency and like eat how you would normally eat. Don't try and impress your trainer. And then I have them track like their movement and steps because I think today, um, this is way more a problem today than it was 15 years ago when I first started. It's, it blows my mind. Uh, when we look at what the average American moves, like mm -hmm. we're, we're somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 steps a day is what the average American steps right now. But if you had a tracker on and you were to go for a walk for an hour, you would surpass that. So that means in a 24 hour day, most people don't even fucking move in an hour. <laughs> That's crazy. So uh, tracking your movement and tracking what you're consuming, I think is huge. And then instead of taking things out of the diet or adding all kinds of crazy exercise, I actually like to add food, nutrition, nutritious food that they're probably not getting. Almost every single time they're over consuming on sugar uh, and too much processed foods. Uh, a lot of my ladies won't be getting enough protein, uh, not enough healthy fats. So I tend to look at somebody's food for a week and find an area where I think they're not getting enough nutrients and I first show them, okay, let's start to implement that, put that into the diet. And more often than not, when you start to put good healthy foods in there, it starts to limit some of the bad foods and that's without me saying, take this away. Right. If you restrict people or say you can't have this from them, it turns into this demonizing thing and this I can or I can't and I'm bad, I'm good, which I'm trying to get rid of that. It's more about like, let's talk about what your body needs mm -hmm. to run optimally so you kick ass at work, you kick ass in your relationship, you kick ass in the gym. We've all too made the mistake in the beginning of overwhelming our clients with too much of our, our knowledge and information and. We want to set them on this path um, and, and get, get them to success fairly quickly. Um, but we, what we found in our careers is we have to really simplify the process and just present it uh, in a way where they can focus on one to two things at a time. And what are those big things? And it's, it's like the most simple things you could possibly think of sleep, better nutrition choices and habits, you know, movement and then stress management. You know, those types of things where 
it's so overlooked these days. Like sleep is such one of those things that we all kind of had this um, sort of epiphany, like of the impact that sleep really had. Well, on... it sucks as an answer. Everybody wants to hear what. The, <laughs> yeah, the, and it's not sexy. Does. Like everybody wants to hear. Just give, I want to hear the pill or yeah, tell me right. this. What, you know, can, what uh, can I take or what thing can I follow? Uh, but the truth is. Those are the big rocks. Yeah, I'll tell you what, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a massive lack of awareness surrounding uh, nutrition. And, and it's, it's for, for a few different reasons. Uh, one is it's, we can't trust our body's natural systems of, of signaling anymore. So, for example, the signal of satiety, like when, when I feel like I'm, I'm, I've had enough food. Now, why can't you trust that nowadays? Well, most diets com are comprised of a majority of processed foods. And processed foods are highly engineered. They're engineered to override your systems of satiety. And I'll give you an example. If I were to take you know, uh, 2,000 calories worth of plain you know, white baked potato, no salt, no butter, and I put that in front of you and I said, eat this in 15 minutes, you wouldn't be able to do it. But if I put potato chips in front of you, that wouldn't be a problem. Most of the money that goes into uh, designing foods doesn't go into the nutrition, doesn't go into any of that stuff, goes into making them as highly palatable as possible. Everything from the taste to the crunch to the, the mouthfeel to all these different things. And so it's hard to trust our systems of satiety when we're overriding them with foods that, for most of human evolution, simply didn't exist. Then you have the, our hunger. Uh, we can't, we, most people don't know what it feels like to be hunger, hungry. And I know that sounds shocking, but think about it. Uh, we know that fasting's got tremendous health benefits. Most people have never gone longer than 15, 16 hours without food their entire lives. Maybe 24 hours one time when they had a medical procedure or something <laughs> yeah. like that, right? Yeah. None of us had ever felt hunger. So what we, had, what we think hunger is, is cravings. So when someone says, oh, I'm starving, they have no idea what that feels like. What, they, what they're having is a craving. And what does cravings come from? Emotion context, the people around you. When you say the context, what do you mean? Because I think this messes up a lot so of like people. A movie, oh, like a oh, movie yeah. popcorn. Yeah, go to, the, great example. go to the movies. You know, you, you crave popcorn at a, yeah. at a movie. But you didn't want popcorn until you walked yeah. in that door, right? Yeah. Advertisers know this and they create these associations. And so then we start to crave foods based on context. Become aware of that. You can actually change that. So I'll give you an example because you can actually take this and work it to your advantage. So there's a lot of things that we get from food aside from just the taste. Unfortunately, most of us just know taste. That's the one we really pay attention to. But there's a lot of things we get from food. Um, how we feel, our energy, uh, there's emotions attached to food. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a client a, a, a long time ago who was probably the most unhealthy person I'd ever met in my life in terms of nutrition. It was terrible. She didn't drink water, literally. Like all she would wake up in the morning, Diet Coke, and then that's all she would have all day long. And so, we started out with changing, making very basic changes to her nutrition. And one of them was to get her to start eating vegetables. Now she hated vegetables. She said she gagged when she ate vegetables. So over the course of the months that I, I trained her, I taught her to pay attention to other things, other signals in her body that were associated with the foods that she ate. So she started figuring out that the bagel that she ate in the morning with all the cream cheese caused a little bit of bloating. She started to realize that when she did have some broccoli, digestion was better, skin was better, energy was better. She just felt better overall. Over time, that association with the broccoli actually got her to eat more broccoli. She started finding that she wanted to eat more broccoli because of those positive associations. So you can actually change how you perceive foods based on some of these positive signals that we get from a lot of healthy foods. And look, when you're eating processed foods all the time, we know that the way your body, your brain perceives the taste of things will change uh, based on what you eat all the time. So if you eat a lot of sugar, a lot of processed sugar, fruit isn't gonna taste that sweet because the processed sugar is just overriding all those you know, receptors in the brain, whatever. Things get down-regulated, you start to perceive things differently. I tell you what, you go on a 24 or 48 hour fast, go grab a, a fruit, grab a strawberry, and see how it tastes. All of a sudden, it's like biting into a Skittle. You know, it's incredible. <laughs> How often do you guys fast? Sal's every month three yeah. for 72 hours. I notice a lot of health benefits from it initially, anti-inflammatory, gut health, um, you know, just felt better. But now the reason why I fast isn't for the physical health benefits. Now it's the, I don't know what you want to call it, spiritual effects or whatever. It's the breaking the chain from food. Because I, I started to realize how often I ate because I was bored 
or because I was supposed to eat. Like, oh, it's noon. I'm supposed to grab some food. Mm -hmm. and, I, and all of a sudden, I had all this time on my hands. And like, what do I do now? And when I'm stressed out, I feel like I want to grab something to eat. But I'm supposed to be fasting today. And so it really changed my relationship with food. Now, of course, fasting could also create a negative association with food. So it's not like a, a, a cure-all. But for somebody who came from the side of fitness where I was force feeding myself every two or three hours, which right. by the way is a myth, that doesn't build more muscle. Um, fasting was like, I mean, it was, it was a game changer. A game changer oh, for all of them. Muscle mm -hmm. didn't fall off my body. You know, I'm feeling better. And then when I refeed, I actually get stronger and feel better and I'm assimilating food better. Well, this is fantastic. So I do it now more for those effects than anything else. Talk to me. It's so interesting that you use the word spiritual. How do you have to do something to frame it as a spiritual act or how does that tie in? Food is a massive distraction for most people. Stop eating for, for two days and realize, and then you'll realize just how much you cope with your day-to-day -day stresses, anxieties, or issues with food. Take that away, and you're left with you're facing your yeah, no, issue. I'm it forces sober. you to be more hyper aware of everything that you're going through. Your body literally talks to you. The way we talk about fasting, I think, is different than people in our own space. It's we, and we called that when we first started talking about fasting. Is like we talked all about all the benefits of it, but watch how our space will market it. And now it's being marketed as it's like a fat burn as solution. A, as, yeah, as a right. fat loss. Frustrating. But yeah, it's um, it, it's it's a just. It's the most abused drug in Western societies. Food. 100%. 100%. What do most people die of, you know, in, in America? It's a, the abuse of food. It's the overeating of food. It's the eating the wrong types of food. Think about what you do when you're bored, you know? I mean, you ever hear people tell you how much easier it is to not overeat when they're busy yeah. versus when they have nothing to do? Mm. Dude, fasting was a game changer for me. From a biological perspective, it is utterly fascinating. Autophagy and all the other things that are happening in the body where you're breaking down the sick and uh, malformed cells and proteins and all that, which that's already amazing. But then I've literally never heard somebody talk about the spiritual side before, mm. which is exactly why I do it. Now mm. I'll sum it up a little bit differently and say for me it's doing the hard thing. It's constantly having your mind drip on you. Like, oh, you could have that, you could have that. And I remember the very first time I fasted, I woke up in the middle of night two with the worst headache ever. Now, because it's a spiritual experience for me, I wake up and I'm like, it hurts to even lay my head on a pillow. And so I'm like, oh God, this is total misery. Like, I can't think straight. Like, I should just go have some Advil. And then I was like, wait a second, does Advil have calories? <laughs> and because I didn't know if it had calories, I wouldn't let myself do it. And so I had to like muscle through because I was like, at the end of this three day fast, I am going to be able to say I had nothing but water for three mm, days. Right. Right. And that's it. Like that meant something to me. Yeah. And so not taking the Advil and pushing through, it became like I have now done a hard thing. It's present in every major religion in the world as a practice for a reason for thousands of years. And it's because of the profound benefits that it has on you, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually. It is something that is, it is an absolute game changer. And when you look at some of the advancements that we've made in Western societies, I mean, pe far more people now die of uh, too much food than too little food. We, we've moved away from the, the benefits of being without. We're never with a, think about that. Like how, how many people do you know that have never gone a day without eating. Mm. Most people from mm. the day that they're born. Has there been anything else that's counterintuitive like that that you guys have come across that almost gets a religious reaction from people when you, because like even bringing up fasting can wind some people up. I got a good one for you. Cardio is one of the worst ways to get lean. And I know I'm gonna blow everyone's mind by even saying that. Even mine right now. Yeah, so. Absolutely. So let me explain uh, you know, what I'm talking about. So. Uh, I'll, now you can't get around the fact that you need that there's a calorie balance or the, the you know what is it the second law of thermodynamics right calories in versus calories out so you need to be able to burn more calories than you take in in order to tap into your fat stores and become leaner and there's two ways we can look at it we can look at it uh, uh, either I'm burning a lot of calories manually or I'm getting to burn more calories getting my body to burn more calories automatically. Now, on a time versus time basis, if we were to compare an hour of cardio versus an hour of, let's say, weight training, cardio definitely burns more calories, much more calories. It's, it's, a, it's a manual way of doing it. But resistance training does something 
far different. Resistance training tells your body to burn more calories on its own automatically. Now in the context of modern life, where food is easily accessible, it's everywhere, where most of us are sedentary throughout the day, um, you want a faster metabolism. You want your body to want to burn more calories. Cardio also, and all activity does this by the way, all activity sends a signal to your body to become more efficient at that particular activity. This is, this is called, this is adaptation. So if I do lots of cardio, if I get in an elliptical and I go for 45 minutes or I get on the treadmill and I go, go on there for an hour, the signal I'm sending to my body is I'm telling my body to become more efficient at that type of activity, which requires more endurance and it, and it wants me to be more efficient with my calories because remember, I'm burning lots of calories while I'm doing it. Mm. Now, how does it become more efficient? Well, do I need a lot of muscle to do endurance type activity? No, you don't need much muscle at all. You just need enough muscle to keep you moving and you need a lot of endurance in order to continue doing it. So what you find when you do that is a metabolic adaptation where your metabolism starts to slow down. Now they've done studies on this and they'll find that this is absolutely true. You take somebody who's you know, really, really good at running and they'll burn less calories per hour than somebody who hasn't run very often. Um, they've studied modern hunter-gatherers where they find, uh, you know, scientists actually went in, I think it was a Hadza tribe if I'm not mistaken, H-A-D-Z-A if I'm not mistaken. They went in and they, and they did some pretty sophisticated testing to test out their metabolic rates. Now they're very active compared to the average person uh, or the average Westerner. And they predicted that they would be burning something like two or three, uh, two or three times the calories of the typical, you know, Westerner. Mm. And what they found was that that wasn't true at all. They actually burned a little bit more calories. Their body adapted. And because mm -hmm. their body adapted. Now, now, now why, why, is that, why would that make sense? Well, if you're a hunter-gatherer, does it make sense that your body's going to have you burn a shit ton of calories when food is relatively scarce and hard to come by? Of course not. It's going to adapt. Now, resistance training does something different because resistance training is sending a signal to the body that says, we need more strength to prevent this damage that we're creating with this exercise or this stress. More strength requires bigger muscle fibers. Bigger muscle fibers contract harder. More muscle. More muscle also burns more calories. Mm -hmm. And so the primary signal or the primary adaptation that comes from resistance training is stronger, faster metabolism. The primary signal that we're sending with cardio is become more efficient with calories and increase endurance. And so over time, resistance training is far superior. Look, I've, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a client years ago, young lady who was absolutely obsessed with remaining lean. And she ran about 20 miles a week. So she ran you know, marathons and half marathons. She was active every single day. And she would come in and lift weights with me uh, about once a week. But the majority of her training was this, wow. lots of endurance training. Now, if she ate anything over 1,700 calories, and she weighed about 125 pounds, so she wasn't a massive uh, person, but anything over 1,700 calories, she'd gain body fat. Mm -hmm. Now, when you looked at all of her activities, 1,700 calories wasn't that much at all, but her body had adapted. And I would tell her, if we slowly decrease your cardio and increase the amount of resistance training you do and try to get your body stronger, you'll find that you'll be able to eat more and maintain the same body weight, the same body fat percentage. And over time, we made that switch and we got to the point where she was able to consume over 2,400 calories a day. Whoa. And she started, and she was only running five miles a week. That's a massive difference from 20 miles a week down to five miles a week, focused on, on strength training. So she built a little bit of muscle mm. and she was able to consume an additional 700 calories a day with far less activity. Now think about the average person living the average life. Well, that's where, an extreme analogy for somebody. Imagine this young lady comes in and she's 50 or 100 pounds overweight. I actually don't want her weight to drop at all. In fact, if a month goes by and she's been weight training and training with me consistently three, four times a week and she lost 10 or 15 pounds, I failed. That's how I look at it. And that's hard to tell somebody who's trying to sign up with you and say, hey, I need you to lose me 50 or 100 pounds. But I know if I were to lose her 10 pounds, let's say in the first week, which a lot of people think would be a great thing, it wouldn't be whatsoever because I'm already heading that direction. I'm already starting to adapt her body to lower amount of calories and moving a ton. I don't want that. In fact, I would like to keep her weight right about where it's at. And if I and I know if I hit the sweet spot, because if I've introduced weight training and I've introduced more nutri nutrient dense foods into her diet, then she's definitely building some muscle. And if she's not seeing a huge spike on the scale, we're probably burning a little bit of body fat. So it's probably a nice little even exchange of, at the end of the month, 
we didn't lose any weight, you stayed at net zero, but we probably added five pounds of muscle mm. and, and lost five pounds of fat, you're in a way better place right there than the girl who came in and did it like Biggest Loser style, and I lost her 30 <laughs> pounds in a, in a month's time. I mean, that's a great example. 85% of those contestants put all the weight and some back right. for that exact reason. Yeah, they actually, I forgot which contestant it was, but they, their, their metabolic rate had got so slow, they lost a lot of weight, but they were at the point where they had to consume 1,200 calories a day and work out for an hour a day just to maintain their body weight, which is a kind of a crappy position to be in um, if you're trying to, you know, maintain your health. I mean, you lose, imagine losing 50 pounds and now all you can ever eat is 1,200 or 1,500 calories a day. Yeah, no question. I was talking to uh, some of the contestants on The Biggest Loser, like behind the scenes, and they said the producers literally ask you on day one, do you want to get healthy or do you want to win? Oh, um, yep, yep. Because they're two different tracks. For and sure. And it's like, if you want to go on the healthy track, you're probably going to get bumped in the first couple vote mm -hmm. outs, but you're going to be on a lifelong path of actually knowing what to do and how to lose weight. You're just not going to lose it crazy fast. Um, and I thought, I actually respected that they were that honest, yeah. that it's like, this is a game show. Yeah. So which do you want? Mm -hmm. And if you want to win, then we're going to tell you how to do it. Right. And I thought, okay, but that's also a little dicey in terms of all the people watching the show that think, oh, just go enslave myself to a mm -hmm. Stairmaster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, I'm going to get I remember being a trainer when that, I was a trainer when that, the first season came out. And man, mm -hmm. the gyms were flooded right after that. This mm -hmm. wave of people that were motivated from this new show that came out. Yeah. And that was a major hurdle that I had to get over. Because mm -hmm. I had already known at that point, that's not the healthy way. Like, right. getting you to lose 100 pounds in three months is not ideal. And for sure, not for sure, 85% chance you're going to put it all back on and some. And even the small percentage, the 15% actually keep it off, you should see the lifestyle they have to keep up. They're the ones that just, right. they're a little more determined to keep running their body into the ground. And that's the only reason why they have it. Because it's just, it's inevitable that it's going to rebound. It's going to rebel. You cannot get in a fight with your body. It's going to win every you, time. You will lose. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually a really interesting statement that you can't get in a fight with your body, you're going to lose. Um, to that point, I want to talk about like what happens at a gut level. I heard you talk about... Um, you know, in so many cultures, you'll see like they'll do some sort of prayer. It doesn't have to be religious. Yeah. Why do they do that? So we had uh, who we consider the godfather of wellness, Paul Check, um, and he's I've been never heard that name, so that's already interesting. Okay, yeah. so you, yeah, you've got to meet him. Great, incredible individual, extremely intelligent. I'm always asking like, what are you doing when he does certain things? So we all had dinner, and we serve him his plate, and he does this thing over his food for about. You know, 15 seconds or and so. And we know he's seconds. not religious. Yeah. So that's why it was weird. And anything you know? he starts eating. So after, after we were all done, we get on the podcast and I asked him, I said, Paul, what, I didn't know you were religious. Were you, were you praying before you? And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, I'm not praying. He goes, I'm asking my body if it wants this food. And I'm asking the food if it wants to be eaten. And it, it goes through this whole thing. And I thought to myself, like, well, that's silly. Like, <laughs> like why, why would you? Ask? And then I thought to myself for a second. And. There's a lot of wisdom in ancient traditions or, or cultures that have lasted for thousands of years. And if you look at every single major religion, they all have some kind of a practice before eating, some kind of an awareness practice. If you're in a highly stressed, sympathetic state, um, you're probably not going to be conducive to uh, digesting food properly. To you're going to be in a pro-inflammatory state. This is one of the reasons why I recommend people with gut issues don't eat post-workout. You know, we're always told that you should have food right after you work out. You know, it builds muscle, replenishes glycogen. But in in a post-workout state, you know, inflammation is up. It's supposed to be. It's one of the signals that tells your body to build muscle and all that stuff. But in that higher elevation of in, uh, inflammatory markers or signals in your body. Probably not the best time to introduce food, especially if you have gut issues, because when the gut is inflamed, putting food in there increases your risk of things like leaky gut syndrome or developing autoimmunities to particular types of foods like, you know, food intolerances or whatever. And so it makes sense to slow down, relax for a second, let everything calm down and then eat the food versus what we tend to do when we eat, which is I'm in a hurry. I got 10 minutes, shovel this down my face and go. The other thing I learned from him was to not drink water with my meal, which I thought was kind of strange, but it immediately slows you down and it makes you chew the heck out of your food 
And it I makes you realize how often you take it like yeah. pills. Yeah, you know? just chew, 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 swallow. <laughs> chew, 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 swallow. That was like one of those game changers. When we talk about fasting being a game changer, try eating without oh, fluid. Yeah. One time, like if you've never digested, yeah, process. if you've never ate a meal without fluid, try it one time and just pay attention to like how much you have to actually chew your food. You'd have to chew it like thirty times to actually get it all the way down. It's That's pretty right. Wild. So, so it's really that you know, your state of mind impacts how you digest things. You can increase your your inflammatory markers by a thought. You can change how your 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 central nervous system. Uh, is reacting. You can change your hormone levels. So, and this is all verified, right? I don't even, this is not even controversial to say anymore. So it only makes sense that if you want to be able to utilize that, your, the food that you're eating, create a good, and also create a better relationship with your food. I mean, if I'm constantly eating in a stress state, I am creating a, an association or a connection to that food that may not, may not be serving me. So stop, slow down. If you're religious, pray. If you're not, take a breath you know, ask yourself or just become aware of what you're about to do and what you're about to eat. And then you'll notice that your food choices will start to change and you'll start to feel better as you're eating. Yeah, I, I never would have believed this. In fact, the first time I heard it, I thought it was stupid. I was mm-hmm. like, yeah. And then Lisa was going through what she was going through and we had just talked to every doctor you can imagine, heard every terrible, ridiculous answer, including immunoglobulin transfusions and she was gonna be doing that for six months. It was just crazy town. And then we finally um, started doing sampling of the microbiome to see like what yeah. does she actually have and how's it active and getting down to like the RNA level of what um, metabolites are being produced by the actual bacteria that you have and all that. So getting really specific. And the woman that was walking us through it, a woman named Dr. Helen Massiage, and she said, oh, Lisa, do you meditate before you eat? And, oh, wow, she asked and I was like, what? <laughs> and the woman was like, I'm, literally everything you just said. like." Yeah. With a thought, yeah. you, can, you can fuck up your like inflammatory state, right? With a thought, yep. you can shift out of the parasympathetic into the sympathetic. And like mm-hmm. that it actually impacts the state of your microbiome and thusly what they're producing mm-hmm. from the food, which is why the same meal one day can sit fine and then the next day cause an upset stomach. Oh, look, the, one of the highest concentrations of serotonin receptors in the body is in your gut. Which is they, insane. They call it the second brain. The third is the heart, by the way. And it's funny how we always say, think, you know, feel with mm-hmm. your gut, think with mm-hmm. your heart or you know, with your head. For anybody right now who's watching this and is thinking, oh, you guys are crazy, for sure you felt butterflies when you've fallen in love. For sure you've felt your, your bubble guts if you get real nervous. The term shit your pants comes from uh, something that actually happens when you get super, super frightened. So definitely changing your state of mind definitely will affect your gut. And we know that the gut affects your entire, uh, your, the entire body in terms of health. So how you go into how you eat and how your energy is around your meal, that makes a, a, a tremendous impact. Mm, no, that's super crazy. Like all of that stuff, realizing how interconnected it is, realizing how important that stuff, like meditation was something that I put off for a long time. I just had no, it felt really feminine. Like that's just the <laughs> no bullshit answer. And because by nature, I find that I'm way in touch with my feminine side. Like that was not the thing I struggled mm, with, right? Yeah. You struggle with being too skinny. Yeah. I struggled with being too weak. Like <laughs> I had to, to learn to toughen up. And so mm. anything that made me feel like I was retrograding, I just yeah. didn't want to do. And then Mark Devine, the Navy SEAL, um, it was like basically, Tom, stop being a jackass, like go meditate. (laughs) And because of who he was and everything, I just thought, you know what? Like if this guy's telling me to pull my head out of my ass basically and give it a shot, Mm. I should really give it a shot. And that, that has changed my life. And I'll even say that it's made my business better. It's, for me, it's the ability to get into the parasympathetic nervous system where you're calm and creative. Right, so that alpha wave state that I get into when I'm taking a shower, which is insane. And my business, my biggest business breakthroughs are always in the shower because mm-hmm. I'm so relaxed. And to think that I can get there, you know, on dry land, as it were, at any time, simply by breathing from my diaphragm, of like, you know, literally getting into a space. For me, it's uh, when I can get into a dark space and I play the sounds of like rain or the ocean or something, and I just lose myself in that is so powerful. It's so funny you bring that up because I had the same experience of being kind of feminine. I'm coming from football and you know we kind of we just go operate off of like muscling through everything and over intensifying everything and uh, I had a moment like that too going through Wim Hof and his techniques where I mean you have to immerse yourself in an ice bath 
and I was trying to apply the same sort of operating system I was going off of forever where I would tense my whole body up and try and over my, overpower my way through this environment. And it just humbled the hell out of me. I, couldn't, I could not breathe, I felt like panic until it forced me to release, relax, breathe, calm the system, become aware of how to access that parasympathetic state. And since that, I, I figured out now how to pull those breathing practices into my life and then into business and into at home. Now I actually have a practice in place where I can find that state and how to get there and navigate mm. it. But I feel like a lot of males, you know, with, with yoga practices and meditation, it's just not very appealing. And I think that's why another reason why we try to bring it up so often on the show, mm. uh, being, you know, weightlifters and, um, well, we know, just don't, ad we don't address all the systems. It's so funny to me. Like if you were to, if you're a drag racer for a car and you're trying to get the most horsepower, most performance out of it, but then one of your systems, like say your tires are completely off or not balanced, or you don't have any oil in the engine, but then you're talking about putting a spoiler on the car, putting a tu turbo on it, it'd be like, well, why wouldn't you fix one of the basic systems if you really want to get this extra edge? I feel fitness in your body is the same way too. It's like, we're always looking for the competitive edge with the latest nootropic or the latest fat burner or the pre-workout to get this edge, but it's like, you're not sleeping at night, you're, you're stuffing your face like crazy, you're not feeding your body right, you have all these other systems that are not running properly in your body. It's like, man, you would get so much more out of your body if you actually just kind of focused on, and there, most of those, these things are free, and it's easy. It's like, okay, I just gotta go to bed, or I gotta meditate, I gotta do, that doesn't cost me anything, it just means I gotta be aware, stop and do it, and I think people, if they would just learn to practice some of these things, they would see the performance benefits and they'd see that mo most of these things would actually supersede, you know, whatever latest, greatest mm -hmm. pill is out that's being pushed. Yeah. There's, the, you know, there's, there's getting your body to adapt and then there's optimizing, right? And getting your body to adapt requires a little bit of stress. So it's okay to stress your body too. You gotta push your body sometimes, push your mind sometimes, push your spiritual practice sometimes to get yourself to grow and change. But then there's optimizing when you balance everything out so that you can perform at your absolute best. And that happens by looking at the entire uh, person as an organism, a whole organism. It's not one piece, it's not just muscle, endurance, it's not just nutrition, it's all those things. It's in including your state of mind, including your sense of fulfillment, your sense of meaning, all those things. When you look at all those and you optimize those and balance those, you are capable of some incredible things. If you just try to force everything all the time and you always are pushing adaptation by lots of stress, lots of stress, lots of stress, well, you overcome your body's ability to adapt and now you're in a state of, you know, trying to survive. And um, that's not a good state to be in if you want to perform at the top. Mm -hmm. So going back to those basic building blocks that you guys are talking about, you brought up sleep twice. Mm -hmm. So how can people optimize their sleep? Well, I think oh. right now, I think or something that I've, since the show, had to start doing, I realized that I, have the lights on in my house till 10, 11 o'clock at night. I'm watching TV or I have a computer screen in my bed. And I didn't realize how much that was affecting my sleep and the ability just to fall asleep. So I actually have to, I put my phone away at 7 p.m. It gets put away by the, my nightstand. I turn all the lights off, go buy candle um, or red light. I have got red light at my house. I can feel the difference. Like there, and there's nights, I'll be honest, that I can't do that. I'm in the middle of something. I'm working. And I do work till midnight on some nights, but I'm aware of it. So for me, like to optimize sleep, uh, those practices have to be in place. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I recommend either like an audio book or reading right before bed. I think that really helps calm the mind. And I think that will help get you better mm -hmm. sleep. I have, uh, I have two kids. One of the, my favorite things about having children is you can do these things with them and the results are very clear because mm. kids have way less filters than adults do. Way less, right? So, so I started doing this at home. So I, when the sun goes down, the lights go off and I'll put candlelight on or I'll go real, real dim light. So I'm kind of mimicking you know, natural sunlight. Mm. And when I started doing that, my kids went to bed on time, no problem, slept great, woke up in the morning, refreshed, feeling good, not acting up. When I don't do that, trouble sleeping, my daughter will wake me up because she can't sleep. Um, they'll wake up a little bit more irritable or in a bad mood. They're just not getting as good of sleep or as good quality sleep. So 
Um, so yeah, if you have kids, run that experiment on them yourself and you'll see. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's pretty interesting. It's tested. I tried it out with my kids and we started dimming the lights down and uh, using candlelight and um, it just really it sets the tone. So this has been one of those hacks that I actually stole from Sal that uh, we've applied and it's been, it's been doing good things for How us. How long before bedtime? So probably about an hour actually. I always recommend clients an hour before bed, but ideally you want to match the sun. So when the sun goes down, that's when everything else goes down as well. Mm. And if you have to work on uh, electronics, uh, if you have to do work on a computer, wear something that at least partially blocks some of the blue light that comes from those electronics, because that can tell the brain that the sun is still out. And you'll find that, you know, studies will show that, you, re you know, changes melatonin production and, and, and sleep quality. So lights go down when the sun goes down, put on blue blockers, and then you'll find that your sleep quality should improve as a result. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right, guys, before I ask my last question, tell these guys where they can find Mind Pump. So we have a YouTube channel, Mind Pump TV, and we post uh, fitness tips on there. We do interviews on there. We post some funny stuff. And then, of course, our podcast. That's where we reach the most people, and that's Mind Pump, and you can find it on almost any platform. Um, and then on Instagram, it's Mind Pump Sal, Mind Pump Adam, Mind Pump Justin. We also have a free uh, app that you can download, Mind Pump. And on there, we, the whole reason why we created that is because we have almost 800 episodes. And it's, it allows you to search. So you can search. We've, when it's re anything related to health and fitness, we've probably talked yes. about it at least once or five or ten times. Thoroughly. Yeah. So yeah. if you actually put a topic in there, you can see all the episodes where we've discussed that topic. Oh, that's wicked. Yeah. I don't normally lie and ask an additional question, but I'm going to slide one in. Why mind pump and not like body pump? Uh, or... That's a great well, question. That's a really good question. It... And we, we went back and forth on it for a really long time uh, because we knew when we first started this that we didn't want to pigeonhole ourselves into just fitness. And so we didn't want to be barbell something or, you know, just body workout pump or the something keto like that. Cast or, or something. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. or some diet yeah. name or something. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny because when you, when you, when you work in, in new media, you know, creating a, a niche will get you more viewers mm -hmm. or whatever. Like if we called our podcast like the keto podcast or the paleo podcast, we probably would have got more downloads initially. But then you're stuck, right? And we're all, we all have lots of interests outside of fitness. And, and most of them are related to health. But health is such a broad mm -hmm. you know, spectrum. So we wanted to come up with a name that allowed us to talk about fitness, but also allowed us to have guests on and talk about politics, economics, business, you know, business religion, spirituality, whatever we found interesting. So we had to you know, open that door. I love that. All right, now my real last question for each of you. Um, what is the one thing that people could change right now today to have the biggest impact on their health? The one thing, okay. Um, if you can do this, and this is a tough thing, but if you can do this, dramatically reduce or, or eliminate, if you can, your consumption of highly processed foods. And that, it, th th these are foods that have a, a long shelf life, come in a box, um, that you can, you, know, you can keep stored for a long time. Simply doing that, your body will start to regulate its weight more uh, accurately in terms of health. So if you just eliminate processed foods, you'll find typically that you'll eat less, make better food choices, and you'll find healthy foods or natural foods more palatable, more appealing. It takes about a week or two of withdrawal, but if you just do that alone, most people will see some, some pretty significant change. I think that um, I speak to the step one all the time because I think that's getting worse. It's becoming uh, easier to not leave your home and have everything brought right to you. So, you know, I, I know I rattled off the stat of how many steps the average person takes a day. Uh, I think we're going to see that get worse. And I've, I've changed somebody's body composition without ever touching cardio by just teaching them how to move more throughout their day and create more habits like around that. And I don't think you should go after a generic goal, like just 10,000 steps. I think you should find your baseline and because everyone's going to be different and, and try to increase that by 10% a month, you know, 10% a month, try and step a little bit more before you knew it, know it, you'll be stepping three, four times what you were doing before. And it won't seem like it. You'll mm -hmm. see energy go up, weight loss come down. You won't be sitting down, sedentary, eating all the time. This is a, something that's changed my life personally. Is, and it's so little and simple is every time we, if we eat out, we didn't make the food we eat out. We walk for 45 minutes hour right afterwards. Wow. It uh, helps with the digestive process. Plus you're going to step and move. You're going to burn calories. Um, I think it helps mitigate a lot of the damage from the food that you would consume. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I could go the angle of sleep again, but I think 
just applying a, a breathing practice would be immensely effective. And what that does is it, it really forces you to become present and it forces you to um, calm down and find that parasympathetic state and what that even feels like and experience that. So you can, you can basically give your body a chance to recover. And I, I just don't feel like people give their bodies a chance these days. And we're so overwhelmed and overstimulated with everything that um, I think that message today probably has one of the more impactful um, things behind it. I love that. All right, guys, you're going to want to dive into the world of Mind Pump. These guys are amazing. Having met them up at their own place for the first time, clicking with them immediately and getting a chance to dive deeper into their world and seeing how real they are. I cannot stress that enough. These guys are no bullshit. They give you the raw, honest truth no matter what it is. They're completely vulnerable. They're completely themselves. They debunk things in uh, the standard way of thinking in a way that I find incredible. And one thing that we didn't get to in this episode, which I'm very sad about, but is maybe the thing that makes me love them the most. And it is that they actively seek out disconfirming evidence. Mm -hmm. Anybody that actively seeks out to figure out how they're wrong, how they could evolve their thinking, that are actually open to hearing ideas that do not match their current way of thinking. And they say, look, either I'm going to learn something new and that's empowering, or I'm going to realize, no, I was right in the first place. But at least they put themselves in that position to really open themselves up to the possibility of a new idea, a new answer, in order to evolve their own thinking so they can get better results, so they can help other people get better results. And by the way, they give away so much content, it's crazy. So no matter what you want to do, if you want to change your own physique, you want to learn how to eat, whatever the case may be, they've got all of that stuff for free. So check them out at Mind Pump Media, at Mind Pump Adam, at Mind Pump Justin, at Mind Pump Sal. Get it. It's absolutely incredible. These guys are truly unparalleled in the industry. And the thing you're going to see when you watch them in their normal habitat, the first half of their episode is just absolutely fucking hilarious. <laughs> and then the second half is super deep. They go way into the science and really bringing the two together and knowing that you have to entertain before you have the right to educate. Uh, it's super, super powerful. All right, guys, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Gentlemen, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, brother. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for watching and being a part of this community. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. You're gonna get weekly videos on building a growth mindset, cultivating grit, and unlocking your full potential.